Good morning, everyone. We are so glad you are joining with us today. If you would take a moment to like, share, and comment on this post to spread the message of Jesus with us. If you are new with us today, text NEXT1 to 94090, and a pastor on staff will contact you and help you get connected at a deeper level here at Summit. We are so glad you are with us today. Now we wanna encourage you to get ready to worship. There's nothing better than 
a shout to him today. You know, I find it very interesting that I don't think we think of this a lot, but you know, when David was fighting the giant, when David was fighting all of his enemies, he would say something that was an amazing thing to say. He would say, this is not my battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. In other words, he was saying the outcomes are not ours. Think of this. When, think of it this way. When Jesus came to die for your sins and he came to raise again from the dead, we look at that as redemption. We look at them, him as the lamb. Uh, and from our perspective, that's what he was being. He was being the lamb sacrificed for our life so that our sins could be forgiven. But really, truly, from another perspective, he was being the lion. He was coming to overcome and destroy the works of the devil and to bust through grave so that the enemy could no longer have power over us, power over you, power over me. God is fighting for us. And you need to understand that. That's what Jesus did. He was fighting for our salvation. He was fighting for our eternity. You need to know your God loves you and He cares for you. And He is fighting for you. So in the middle of this season of our life, let's remember that even though we see things a certain way, God is fighting for us. And what we cannot see and what is going on behind the scenes is God is winning our victory. We will not lose. We will win because we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Praise God that we serve a God who is always on our side and fighting for us. And the Bible says, since God is for you, who can be against you? Nobody. Nobody that wants to defeat you can defeat you. Weapons may be formed, but they will not prosper against your life. Amen? Amen. Let's get our bread and our juice and let's receive this communion this morning remembering that what Jesus did on the cross was an unbelievable victory over the enemy and we can have victory as a result father we thank you that as we receive this communion today that we realize that you won the battle you defeated death you defeated hell you defeated the grave and the ultimate victory is to come in our future we thank you that right now spiritually you are fighting for us and I just give you praise, I give you glory, and I thank you for the battle that you fought and won so that we can have victory in this life. And we receive this bread now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you for the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We receive this blood right now and we, we accept everything it represents in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's continue to worship.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Summit Church. My name is Trayla, and I serve here on our women's ministry team. We are so glad you decided to join us this weekend. If you are new with us or want to stay connected here at Summit, text NEXT1 to 94090, and a pastor on staff will contact you and help you get connected. Church, we are so excited to have Jump Kids and Jump Junior back. So come early this Sunday to check your kids in. It's going to be a blast. If you've enjoyed your time so far here at Summit and want to make Summit your church home, you should join us for Summit Next. Summit Next is made up of four experiences that happen each week here at Summit. It is designed to strengthen your relationship with God, share how we operate as a church, and help you reach your full potential. If you are wanting to start Summit Next, Text NEXT1 to 94090 and a pastor on staff will help you start your journey. Our small groups here at Summit have launched back and you can be a part. Small groups here at Summit are so fun and edifying. Groups are a great way to get plugged in and find community. If you want to join a small group, you can see our full list of groups on our website. If you would like to follow along with today's message, you can go to the YouVersion app and access the notes by going to YouVersion events. Hey, good morning and welcome everybody. I'm so glad you decided to be with us today at Church Online. I'm David Gadbury. I'm the lead pastor here at Summit and I'm very excited to bring the word to you today. It is a good word. We're continuing our series called I Dare You to Stop. And today in particular, I'm going to talk to you along the subject, I dare you to stop doubting. I dare you to stop doubting. Something we all need to learn and to develop in our lives and so we're going to get into our text this morning so if you would wherever you're at just pick up your bible and whatever you use for a bible and stand in honor of the reading of god's word or whatever uh, you can do right where you're at but let's get our text this morning james chapter 1 verse 6 through 8 in the new international version let's all read it together you'll see it on the screen here's what it says but when you ask you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Father, help us to understand Your Word today. 
Help us to get this down in our spirit, down in our heart. and Help us to have unwavering, singular faith in You. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be so convinced of Your power and Your ability and Your goodness. And help us, Lord, not to waver in the least. Because we know that You're able to do exceeding abundant above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. So Holy Spirit, have Your way today. As we get into Your Word, have Your way. Teach us, lead us, guide us, change us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Man, today I just really feel moved as I was preparing for this message and developing this message. I just really feel moved uh, by the idea of this interaction and connection that we have with God. It really is amazing. It, it really is uh, unbelievable that this great God that we serve, God Jehovah, uh, the self-existent God, the self-sufficient God, that we have this relationship with Him and that He is the Creator of all things that exist, yet He is personally involved with us. He wants to be personally, individually, specifically involved with us. Yes, He's God in a general sense. He's omnipotent. He has all power. He's omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is omnipotent. I mean, excuse me, omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. He is all of these things. His characteristics are uh, to us in our finite mind, I really believe sometimes we can't grasp or get a hold of all that God is. And God being all of that and then some, it, 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 the fact that He wants to be involved with you and me, the fact that He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the expression of the Father, to us to pay the penalty for our sins and then destroy death by raising from the dead and overcoming that and and then sending us the Holy Spirit to empower our lives and prepare us for His return. Listen, listen, it is amazing to think about that God wants to be personally involved with us. But we have to also understand that this relationship requires things of us. Now, to be saved, no works can save us. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter uh, 2, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, that grace is given to us not because of our works, because we don't want, God doesn't want us to boast thinking we saved ourselves, but that God did save us unto good works. So you can't work for your salvation, but your salvation it causes you to do good works. So once our heart has been regenerated, once our life has been changed, God wants to use us to do things. And if we're going to be a follower of Christ, there's absolutely some requirements of us and one of those requirements, and as a matter of fact, the only requirement to actually be saved is faith. To believe. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We know that the worlds that we see that are visible were created by things that were invisible. So we get it. We understand that we can't always see everything. We can't work out everything. Everything We don't just blindly follow anything. We, we follow based on what we believe, based on what God's Word says. And, and, and uh, so we are believing and setting our faith on Him knowing that we have what we believe for. The Bible says in Mark that whatsoever you desire, when you pray believing, you shall receive it. Yeah, I know that there's a lot of theology out there and a lot of teaching in a lot of circles that would make this all about the amount of faith. How much faith do you have? But it's really not about the amount of faith. I can't believe you said that. Some, I know I can hear some people saying that. I can't believe you said it's not about the amount of faith. No, when we teach that theology about it's the amount of faith, then what we're doing is we're just leaning over on excuses and being able to say to people, well, you just didn't believe enough. It would have changed if you just believed enough. We can't explain why it didn't happen, so we just blame you. You didn't believe enough. And that's really not how this works at all. It's not about the measure of faith. And Jesus cleared this up for us. He said you could move mountains if you had a little mustard seed of faith. He didn't infer or, you know, a lot of people teach it. He was talking about a seed because a seed can grow into a grape. No, he was, he was drawing attention to the fact 
that a little bitty amount of faith can change big things. So it's not the amount of faith, it's the sincerity and the totality of your faith. In other words, you either believe or you don't. Do you sincerely believe? Do you believe that God is who He says He is? And do you believe He can do what He says He can do? Do you take His Word for at value? Do you take His, His Word at face value? Do you read and study His Word and say, I believe this. This is the truth. Do you believe what Jesus said of Himself in John chapter 14, verse 6 when He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by Me? Well, if He is my way, if He is my truth, if He is my life, nothing else is necessary. I need to believe. If I believe, then things change. We're not born again because we did something worthy of being born again. We're born again because we believe that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. We believe that He rose again from the dead. And when we confess that, that He is Lord and Savior of our life, when we repent, turn from our ways to His, when we ask Him for forgiveness, what we're saying is, I believe that what you have done and what you've said you have done is the truth and I receive it as truth. And when we make that confession, the Holy Spirit comes into our life and He changes us from the inside. And then we begin a journey of growth and spiritual maturity and spiritual development because God has started something in us that He intends to finish. The Apostle said, He who has begun a good work in you shall complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. It's something we need to understand. We need to believe. So I'm daring you. Hey, 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 I believe it's more than that. I believe God is daring all of us today in the middle of our circumstances to believe Him, to believe His Word, to trust Him and rely on Him no matter what we can see. I know that sometimes that's hard. It's hard that we have to believe something we can't see when we can see something that looks just the opposite of that right in front of our face. But that's the whole point of faith. And that's what God is trying to engage us to do. I love this passage of Scripture in James chapter 1, verse 6-8 through 8, in the NIV where it says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because those, excuse me, the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Listen. Listen to what he's saying. That person should not expect to receive anything from God. If we doubt, if we waver, if we allow ourselves to be moved this way and that way, that's not faith. And the, what God responds to, a lot of people think that God responds to need. What God responds to is not need, but faith. When we believe Him, and we cannot be moved, and we say, no matter what, I believe God, then that's what God acts on. He said, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So there's four things we need to recognize from this passage of Scripture. Number one, we must believe and not doubt. It is not an option. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So we can't please God. We can't be in this good relationship with God. We can't follow God or Him change our lives or be involved in our lives without faith. Faith is the key. Believing is the key. We must believe and not doubt. So He doesn't just say we must believe. He says we must believe and not doubt. In other words, we can't leave any room for being uncertain. We can't leave any room for, for thinking, well, maybe, maybe not. We can't leave any room for saying, well, I might believe it, but I'm, sure, I'm not sure I believe this part, but I do believe that part. No room for that. We must believe and not doubt. Don't allow the enemy. Don't allow intellectualism. Don't allow people. Don't allow pressures. Don't allow circumstances to create a scenario where you allow doubts to come in and start stealing from your spiritual growth and development. So we must believe and not doubt. And number two, 
we, we have to understand that when we do allow doubt in our lives, it causes us to be blown and tossed by the wind. Listen, life is always going to have wind. Life is always going to have waves crashing. There's always going to be moments where things are not perfect. And if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves tossed to and fro. We're going to be of two minds. We're going to be going this direction, then that direction. We're not going to be able to make up our minds. We're not going to be singular in our vision or singular in our purpose or singular in our faith. We're simply just going to be unstable. And there's far too much instability in the body of Christ today. We really, really need to get back to our anchor so that our boat is not being whipped over here and whipped over there and and pushed over here and dashed along the rocks, but that our anchor holds and it's held steadfast by our faith. And we're saying we are immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because we are anchored to God by our faith. We don't want to be unstable we need to also understand that if we are going to allow doubt in our minds and doubt in our hearts and we're not going to believe God the way we should or the way His Word instructs us to do or encourages us to do, then we have to realize that we should have no expectation to receive anything from God. Now, that sounds intense. Because in our world today, for some reason, we just believe, I think a lot of times we only go to God when we really have need. But then we just believe that God is just available to hear anything and everything that we say and He's just going to do something. But the Bible is very clear right here that if you are double-minded, if you're not really believing and you're allowing doubt to rule your thoughts, don't expect the prayer to be answered. Don't expect to get the solution that you're wanting. Set your faith on God. We're going to talk about how. Don't have two minds. This word literally right here where it says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The Greek word here is schizo. It's where we get the word schizophrenic from. It means to be multiple-minded. We have two minds. In other words, there's a compartmentalization in our brain, uh, in our mind, in our life where we put things in compartments and we have a, a, a duality of thinking and we just we just allow ourselves to be unstable and un focused and distracted why because we're 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 not single-minded we're not focused we're not in faith and i'm just going to tell you it takes boldness and daring to believe and not doubt i mean look at the people who had to do it abraham and sarah i mean here are two older people god made promises to abraham said i'm going to give you a son and your son's going to be your your, your descendants are going to be like the stars of the sky made all these promises to god But years and years and years and years and years went past. God made this promise to Abraham and nothing happened. And finally, when he was 100 and she was 90, I believe, they conceived a child. But they they had to have faith in order for that to happen. Uh, the, 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 The Bible talked about the children of Israel not looking back lest they go back. They had to have faith that God was leading them into a place of promise. Noah. Think about Noah. Noah is a great example of having to be daring and bold to have faith and not doubt. To believe and not doubt. Because there was no reason for a boat or an ark. It hadn't rained on the earth. Everything was replenished by uh, 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 springs that came up from the earth. And so he was building a boat because there was going to be a rain and a flood that was going to cover the whole earth. And he just did this in obedience to God. took him 120 years to build the ark. So it was a long time of, I'm sure, ridicule and pressure. And God, when are you going to show up? And God, when is this going to happen? And why do you have me doing this? I'm sure that there could have been opportunities for that. But the Bible gives us no indication or inclination that Noah ever felt that way. It just says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God asked him to do it, and he did it. And when he did it, he saved his family. And really, he saved all the descendants of the earth. Moses was the same way. He felt ill-equipped. God told him, I want you to deliver my people. And Moses did it. Why? Because he believed God, not himself. When he went to God and said, who am I? I'm nobody. God said, it doesn't matter who you are, Moses. It matters who I am. And that's where God speaks to him and says, I am that I am. I am uh, Jehovah. I am the all-sufficient one. I am Yahweh. I am the self-existent, self-sufficient God. It really doesn't matter who you are, Moses. It matters who I am. 
and, 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 and I am. They said, well, who do I tell is sending me? I am is sending you. Uh, the su- self-sufficient creator of all that exists. Everything else needs something else to exist. Only God. Only our Father. Only uh, Jehovah. Yeshua. He, uh, uh, excuse me. Yeshua HaMashiach. The reflection of God in Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Listen to me. It's very important that you understand. God is awesome. And He is powerful and he is mighty and he wants to do great things in our life and when he said who do i send he said i am i am i am i am just existent i don't need any backing i don't need it to leverage anybody else's power i don't need anything else to exist just tell them i am sent you i want you to understand that's who we serve and the interactions between us and him if we want god to deliver us in this time if we want God to deliver us from COVID, if we want God to deliver us from political upheaval, if we want God to bring peace, listen, we need to start thinking the way God thinks. We need to start trusting in God. Trusting God totally is an act of courage. It's an act of boldness. It requires us to look at the face of our circumstances and as we talked about last week, say even if things don't turn out the way I think they should, I'm still going to believe. I'm still going to trust God. Why? Because what happens in life are oftentimes antithetical to the Word of God. What happens in life physically that we see is antithetical to what's happening in the Spirit. You know, a few years ago, I think it may have been last year, a year before that, we had a day here in West Texas. I'm not sure how far it went or how broad it was, but we had a day where the wind was blowing significantly. Now, that's nothing new for us in West Texas. I think I read an article that said uh, Amarillo is literally the windiest city in the United States of America. And I think it's an average of 20 miles per hour winds or something like that, an average over 365 days. It's a windy place, but this was different. And it was, it, it was, there was no storm. It wasn't clouds. It wasn't rain. It wasn't thunder and lightning. It was just wind. And the winds got up towards 70 and 80 miles an hour, straight winds. And they, they actually called it a land hurricane. And, and I'm just telling you, as the wind blew, I mean, even hard enough, we were sitting in our house. I don't know if you remember that or where you were when that was going on. But I was watching uh, the television and diesel trucks were literally driving down the road and just being knocked over. I had a friend that was uh, on a youth trip and he was coming back from the youth trip and he had, he had uh, his truck and a trailer behind him and he was pushing that thing to the floor and couldn't get it to go more than 60 miles an hour. Uh, it, it, the wind was unbelievable and it was blowing. Shingles were flying off of our house. I, I remember going out because I wanted to see how much damage was being done and I walked around the back of my house in the the house was acting as a windbreak and I could feel very little wind and it was quiet. But then as soon as I turned the corner around my house, literally I had to catch myself because it almost knocked me to the ground. It was so intense. But you know what we didn't do? What we, what we did do is we stayed in the house. What we didn't do is go try to find another place to be. Why? Because we trusted the builder. We did not doubt that the house would hold. Now some shingles may have fallen off. There may have been some rattling of windows. But we knew the foundation was strong. We knew the house was built well. We didn't have any reason to get in a vehicle and try to go find some place underground. Those straight winds lasted all day long. So much so that it was just there was a just nervous edge to, to me at the end of the day. It was just so weird. And... Um, I just remember, though, thinking after that, I said, you know what? We just have confidence that we were safe. You see, the question I have for you and me today is, do we trust the builder of our house? Do we trust the builder, the framer of this world? Do we trust Him? Do we rely on Him? Do we have faith in Him? So we have to ask some questions. The question is, what, what is doubt exactly? Why do we find ourselves doubting why is it hard to trust what are the challenges that make this difficult faith that is what what is what is believing 
and faith really? How do we turn our doubts to faith? How do we turn our fears to courage? How do we develop a confident trust in God that chases doubt away? I want to tell you that God sees and hears and loves and cares about you. So before you get into condemnation about, you know, I do have some areas that I doubt God in, and I do have some questions that I wonder about the Word, and, and you know, there are times in my life where I've really wanted to believe, but I find myself going, I'm just not sure. And I'm not just talking about salvation, I'm talking about God's interaction in your life overall. And my question to us today is, do we feel condemned by that? You should never feel condemned. I'm reminded of a New Testament interaction between Jesus and a man who was wanting Jesus to help him with his son. His son was ill, I believe, possessed with the devil. And he said to the man to just believe. And the man said, he told him not to doubt. And the man said, help thou my unbelief. Now, I just want to encourage you that this is, this is the Jesus that we serve. That even when we do have doubts, even when we do have questions, even when we are uncertain, that, that we can literally go to Him and say, okay, I've got some doubts. Help me with my doubts. And He's more than willing and more than capable and more than able to help you. Jesus taught us the importance and power of faith. There's a Scripture in Luke chapter 8, verse 50. In the Amplified Bible, it reads this way, but Jesus, hearing this, answered him, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe and trust in me. Have faith in my ability to do this. And she will be made well. Now, that sounds like an easy thing for Jesus to say. Jesus, hearing this, answered him, Do not be afraid. Only believe in me and have faith in my ability to do this. Can I just tell you something? I think one of the reasons we struggle with doubt and fear and unbelief is because we're distracted by all the noise of what's going on in our life. We're distracted by things that we, we're you know, trying to keep ourselves going. We want more of this and more of that and more of this and more of that. And, and we're filling our lives up and then we have circumstances and we have negativity and we have issues and we have situations. And, and I think these things fill up our life and they become this noise that causes us to be distracted from our focus on Jesus. Now you have, to, you have to understand, this sounds like a very simple statement and a very simple interaction between Jesus and this man, but you have to understand when it says, but Jesus hearing this, what did He just hear? Well, this man had come to Him and said, can you come and heal my daughter? She's sick unto death. In other words, she's going to die. And Jesus said, sure, let's go to your house. And on the way to the house, another woman stopped him and needed healing. And he healed her. And in the process of that time, the servants came from this man's house and said, listen, don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter has died. Now, those were the circumstances under which Jesus said what he just said. Listen to me. Those were, the, the man had just been told in Jesus' hearing She's dead. There's no reason to even do anything else. It's over. It's final. It's finished. I just got a report from a friend of mine today that last two, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, she had real pain. They took her uh, to the doctor. And, and when she went to the doctor, they checked her and, and they, told, they came back and she's a young lady, young single lady. And they told her, listen, uh, this is bad. Your blood is off the charts. A high would be the number 300. You're at 3,900. There, there is no doubt that you have cervical cancer. We're going to send you to a specialist. They sent the specialist. The specialist looked over the specialist looked over all of the reports, looked over the blood, uh, looked at the different uh, imagery, and said, "Yes, it, it looks like you have cervical cancer." He's beginning to tell her how to prepare, what the you know how she responds to the surgery. They were going to do an urgent surgery, so. Just yesterday, I got a report that they went in to do that surgery. And when they went in to do the surgery, they removed the mass. And unfortunately, they had to move, remove one ovary. And, and, and uh, when, when, when they removed it, the, the surgeon came out, talked to her mom and said, listen, we don't know what's happened, but the mass is gone and we have investigated. We've put it under the scope. We've done everything to look at it intensely. And that we don't see any cancer or any thing like cancer and so 
uh, uh, we're going to you know, make sure to send it off for testing and, and get, get you the confirmation on that, but no cancer. So listen, she had been given basically a death sentence and within three weeks time of saints praying and her believing and setting faith and doing what God told her to do, God intervened on her behalf. Nothing is ever final when Jesus is involved. Nothing is ever final when Jesus is involved. And, and, and let's just think about it. Even if you were to die on this earth, this is a very short, small thing compared to eternity. And if you're a believer and you do pass away because every one of us are going to at one point or another, we're going into the presence of God. Listen, God will deliver us. God will help us. God is available to us. So here he is getting this report. The daughter's dead. And his response to him is, listen, stop. Don't be afraid. Listen to me. I'm, I'm saying that prophetically to you right now. I just feel like there are some people listening to me that you're just walking around right now because all that's going around with COVID, all that's going around with the political up, upheaval, I'm just trying to talk to you today. Listen. Listen to me. I, I believe that there's someone who needs to hear this specifically from God today. Listen. You've got like kind of a, a low grade fear that's just humming in the back of your mind and just worrying you and stressing you. And you need to hear Jesus say to you right now, hey, 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 stop, stop, stop. Don't fear. Only believe. In other words, don't leave room. Don't make room for doubt. Don't leave openings in your life for doubt. Don't let fear overtake you. Don't let anxiety overrun you. Just believe. Don't do anything. Here's what Jesus is saying to him in the moment. Don't do anything else but believe. I believe that's what Jesus is daring us to do right now. He's saying to us as a church across the world, I dare you to set your faith on me. I dare you to believe me again. I dare you to believe that I can heal the sick and raise the dead and cause blind eyes to see... I, I, I dare you to believe that I can change the world. I dare you to believe that I can save souls and change lives and deliver people who are under bondage. I dare you to believe that there's a heaven. I dare you to believe that if you know me, you'll go there. Come on, I believe that God is challenging us in our spirit today and saying, don't be distracted. Don't look around to the fear. Don't listen to the fear mongers. Just believe. Don't leave room for anything else. Regardless of modern thinking. It isn't that you believe. It is who is the object of your faith. Belief isn't just this amazing energy that empowers us to do more than we thought we could do because we believe we can. No, it matters in whom you believe. You can believe, you know, you remember that song, I believe I can fly <laughs> when the Michael Jordan movie came out. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. You remember that? Just because you believe you can doesn't mean you can. You can sing that song till the day is long, but if you go jump off a building, you're not going to fly, you're going to die. <laughs> That's the truth. It's not just that you believe. It's in whom do you believe. I can hear the modern philosophers say, all you need to do is just believe in yourself. Well, where does that get you? The farthest you can go in believing in yourself, which is nothing wrong with believing in yourself, having confidence in yourself and in your abilities and your talents, but the farthest that gets you is some temporal success. It doesn't even affect or impact eternity. You just need to believe you can do it, they say. You just need to believe and be positive. And while those things are good and there's nothing wrong with them, what we need for transformation in our lives, what we need for eternal impact on our lives, we need to believe in Jesus. Our faith needs to be in Him. We need to believe Him. We need to believe His Word. It's very important that we know this and we operate in this and that we don't let anything distract us from this. You know, doubt. Doubt just means to be uncertain about. It means to consider questionable or unlikely. It means to hesitate to believe. Maybe to distrust or to fear. Be apprehensive about. That's what doubt is. In other words, when you're faced with crisis, 
when you want to believe God will do what He says He will do, are you allowing apprehension to enter the picture? Are you allowing uncertainty to overtake your mind? Are you listening to voices that are leading you down a, 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 a path that is going to be negative for you? To believe simply means to have confidence in the truth. The existence of the reliability of something. Although without absolute proof that one is right in doing so. Listen, we can't prove it necessarily in that sense. I don't know exactly every detail. I don't have evidence of every single thing. But here's what I know. I do know that the Word of God stands firm down through the ages. I do know that the truth resonates with my spirit and my soul. I do know that there have been confirmations to prophecies and things of that nature, and I can believe this. But most importantly, I do know that I believe my Jesus and I have experience in that relationship with Him. We're not being asked to merely believe some random leading of the Spirit. A lot of times when people talk about faith or they talk about not doubting, they give examples of those kinds of things. The Holy Spirit told me to do this and I went and did it. The Holy Spirit told me to do that and I went and did it. And that's good and we need to learn how to do that. But you know what God's really just asking us to do? Obey His Word. Believe what His Word says. A lot of times we're asking God, give me a word so that I can trust You. Give me a word so that I can believe You. And we're wanting some mystical thing to happen where someone comes and confirms our feeling. And that's great and I'm glad when God does that. And He's done that many times in my life. And He's used me to do that a lot in other people's lives. But can I tell you what God really just wants? He wants to say, look, I've given you my word. 66 books, 39 Old Testament books, and 27 New Testament books, and all of them correlating to bring you the message of redemption and bring you the message of freedom and bring you the message that you can trust God. And He's expressed Himself as Jesus and He has affected and impacted all of history. And He loves you and He cares about you and you can trust Him. We trust. We have confidence. We rely on and adhere to the promises and proclamations of the Bible. And everything the Holy Spirit leads us to do beyond that. But the Bible is the most important thing and that's what God is asking us to trust. Knowing the Bible, studying the Bible, reading and meditating on the Bible builds faith and it changes our lives. We're being asked to trust that. We're being asked to trust that. And I'm just going to tell you, I've been saved for well over 30 years. Many years more. And i got to tell you, you can trust this Bible. You can trust God. I have served Him for a long time. And He has been trustworthy every minute of every day. I haven't always been trustworthy, but He's always been trustworthy you can trust his word you can rely on this you can adhere to the scripture you can obey this word you can absolutely walk in the proof of god's amazing truth the bible says in proverbs chapter 30 verse 4 through 5 and amplified he who ascended into heaven and descended who was who was gathered who has gathered the wind in his fist who has bound the waters in his garment who has established all the ends of the earth what is his name and what is his son's name certainly you know every word of god is tested and refined like silver he is a shield to those who trust and take refuge in him the word of god every word of god is refined like silver james chapter 1 verse 21 says so get rid of all uncleanness and all that remains of wickedness and with a humble spirit Receive the Word of God, which is implanted, actually rooted in your heart, which is able to save your soul. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, Remember your leaders, for it was they who brought you the Word of God. And consider the result of their conduct, the outcome of their godly lives. And imitate their faith, their conviction that God exists and is the Creator and Ruler of all things and provider of eternal salvation through Christ, and imitate their reliance on God with absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and goodness. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God 
is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's penetrating as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, the completeness of your person. And both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. All of that to say this, the Word of God is trustworthy. The Word of God is transformative. It's not just about getting education or information from the Word. It's about letting the Word transform you. The Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And when you get into the Word, it doesn't just educate you or inform you. It changes you. The Bible says that we are renewed. We are renewed day by day by the Word of God. We need to understand that God's Word is effective and powerful to change things in our life. Things that we haven't been able to overcome. Things that we haven't been able to get through. God's Word gives us the power, the authority, the understanding, and the transformation from the inside to be able to do it. Believing always leads to action. When we have the boldness, when we dare to stop doubting and start believing and set our faith singularly on God, it always leads to certain obedience and action. Our beliefs empower our actions. In other words, faith always leads to faithfulness. When we really start believing God, it brings out things in our lives that wouldn't have been there before. You know, Jesus told a story. And I'm I'm closing with this. Jesus told a story where He said there were two men. One uh, built his house one way, one built his house another. And what he said, he said, you know, in life, storms come. And one man built his house on the sand. He didn't have a firm foundation. He built his house on the sand, went down on the beach. He said, I love this view. I'm just going to build my house. And he builds a house. And as life does, a big storm came through. Rain hit the house. Wind hit the house. And the house fell over. The Bible says, and great was the fall of it. In other words, it was totally destroyed. It was, it was total. Nothing saved. And there was another man that built his house on the rock. He had a firm foundation. And that firm foundation kept his house from falling. The same wind, the same storm, the same rain came to his house, but his house stood. Why did it stand? It stood because the foundation kept it strong. He said, those of you who hear the words of my Father and do not do them. You are like the man who built his house on the sand. Storms are going to come. They come to everyone. And it's going to leave you with a deficit. But those of you who build your house on the rock, or you are those who hear the word of my Father and you obey it, you've got a firm foundation. You see, faith always leads to faithfulness. Believing always leads to acting and when we act on what we believe it builds a foundation under our life that causes all the hell and all the problems and all the issues that come at us to dissipate because it cannot blow us over it cannot destroy our house why because we've built our house on the rock jesus christ god is definitely right now daring us to believe him he, he, the question is, will we dare to believe? Will we boldly put our faith in God, trust Him unequivocally, and not be pushed around by our circumstances or our insecurities or people's opinions? Now, right now, is when faith is important. It's in times like these that faith counts. When things are going well, we still need to have faith and we still need to believe But it's much easier to do so when there's no problems in your life. But it's when the suffering comes and when the hardships come and when the difficulties come. And not only to you, but to everyone around you. That's when faith counts. That's when truly believing counts. That's why we can't let ourselves be distracted. We can't let ourselves be moved. We can't let ourselves be pulled off of our our search and seeking and passion for God. No, we have to dig in deeper. We have to seek His face more. We have to know that He's what we want more than anything else. Because it's in these moments, 
that faith counts the most. It's in these moments that our standing up, believing and speaking to the mountain and saying, you be removed and be cast into the sea. This is when it's most important. So the question is, do we trust God to know what's best? Do we trust God in the time, in the timing of His deliverance and help? Do we trust that God knows what we don't know and that that's okay? Do we trust God so much that we'll do what He says no matter what the situation seems to call for? I'm daring all of us, every single one of us, to get so deeply into the Word that we chase doubt out of our minds and out of our hearts. That we start believing again like we believed when the first time when we came to salvation. The greatest miracle that God does is saving a man's soul. And if you believed Him for that, you can believe Him for anything else. Only believe. Can we? When faced with problems all around, deny the distractions and only believe. So I leave you with this. The question is, that we need to ask is who is this we're believing in? And I'm just going to leave you with seven statements from the book of John. Jesus Himself said, I am the bread of life. We're putting our trust, our confidence, our faith, our belief in the One who as bread sustains physical life, Christ offers and sustains spiritual life. He is the bread of life. We we are believing in setting our faith on the light of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. And by the way, these I am statements that Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, made in the New Testament is a direct reference and correlates to what uh, God said to Moses when He said, I am that I am sent you the self-existent, self-sufficient God of all things. He said, I am the light of the world. That's who we're believing in. He said, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus protects His followers as shepherds protect their flocks from predators. The fourth thing says, I am the resurrection and the life. Death has no final word with Jesus. Jesus is always bigger and better and more magnificent than anything else that can hold us back. Number five, He said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is committed to caring and watching over those who are His. Number six, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the source of all truth. He is the way. He is the life. And He lastly said, I am the true vine. And by attaching ourselves to Christ, we enable His life to flow in and through our lives. And we cannot help but bear fruit that will honor God. And our faith will be set in our belief. We cannot stop doubting unless we start believing. We're not merely believing in an ideology or a philosophy, but we are placing our trust and reliance and adherence on a person named Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of our soul. Father, we thank You for Your Word today. We thank You. We ask You that Your Holy Spirit will chase doubt out of our hearts. Help us with our unbelief. When we don't believe, when we are uncertain, when we feel uneasy, God, help us to believe. Help us to trust. Help us to rely on You. Lord, help us as Janae and I trusted the builder of our home, trusted the framework of our home, trusted the foundation to hold steady when that wind of life hit Lord, Heavenly Father, help us to do the same with You. That the winds of life are hitting us now. They're knocking shingles off. They're affecting us in big ways. Help us, Heavenly Father, all of us, to look to You, the I Am that I Am. And without any doubt, totally believe that You are our protection, that You are our deliverer, that You are our healer, that You are our Savior. And most importantly, You are our Lord. God, help us to get so full of Your Word and so stirred by Your Spirit that we do not doubt, but we 
only. Listen, I'm going to give you one opportunity here today if you don't know Jesus or you need to rededicate your life to Jesus. Listen, it's just this simple. You know in your heart right now as I've been preaching the Word that if you're right or not with God because the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart. And if you know you're not and you need to make a decision to follow Him, maybe you've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins, come into your life. Maybe you have had that relationship with Him before, but you know things aren't right between you and Him. You need to rededicate your life to Him. I just want to pray for you today and I want you to pray with me. I'm not going to go into this a long time, but all it just simply means is you're saying to God, Lord, I'm turning away from my ways and I'm turning to Your way. And I'm asking You to come into my life and I believe You are the Lord and Savior of my life. I believe You died for my sins. I believe You rose again. And, And if you want to make a decision to follow Him today and Him to change your life, just pray this prayer after me. Mean it in your heart. And then, after we pray the prayer and after this worship experience is over, make sure you connect with one of our pastors at, ch- at Church Online. And make sure you get the information that we need to give you to help you along your spiritual journey and what next steps you need to take. So pray this after me. Father God, I come to You in the name of Your Son, Jesus. I repent. I turn from my ways. I turn to You. Please forgive me of my sins. Change me. Make me a new creation. I believe You died for me. I believe You rose again from the dead. And I ask You to come into my life. I commit to follow You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God, I'm so excited that you made that decision today. Thank you so much for being a part. And thank all of you for being a part of our worship experience today. And I just want to say thank you so much for being givers and helping the ministry of the kingdom to continue to move forward as we do what God's called us to do and reach out to people and spread the gospel in every way and in everywhere that we can. And I want to encourage you just to keep doing it. You know, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The principle here is this God so loved, He gave. So I want us to have the character of God. I want us to have the nature of God. And he, the nature of Christ is to love so much that it causes us to give. And we're His ambassadors and we represent Him well. So let's all let love reflect Jesus in and through us, especially with our generosity. So I want to encourage you to give your tithe and give your offering. I want to encourage you to be a part of the outreach we're doing right now to help students have school supplies for school. And we're trying to take on two uh, uh, schools, the the high school and then uh, an elementary school. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of this. Don't sit back and wait and let somebody else do it. I want to encourage you to be a part of it. Thank you so much for being a part today. Let me just bless you. If you hold out your hands, I just want to give you a, a blessing as your pastor today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Oh man. I'll see you next week. Hey church, thank God for today's message from Pastor David. We hope it has encouraged you. If you would like to take your next steps at Summit, text NEXT1 to 94090 and a pastor on staff will get in contact with you. By texting NEXT1, it allows you to make a decision for Christ, be water baptized, join a small group, connect with the church, or sign up for Summit Next. All you have to do is text NEXT1 to 94090 and you will be connected with a pastor. Church, we are so excited for youth to launch back on August 29th. To find out more information, text NEXT1 to 94090. On August 24th, we are starting our 21 days of fasting and prayer. For more information on the ways to fast, you can visit our website. During the 21 days, we will be having worship on Sunday night, starting August 30th, September 6th, and September 13th. Let's gather our friends and family and lift the name of Jesus. 
If you are wanting to start a small group here at Summit or already lead one, we are inviting you to our small group leader training on August 23rd. Throughout this time, it is so important to stay connected. If you haven't been in contact with your small group, now is the time. If you are needing a small group, you can see the full list on our website. As well as an online worship experience, we will continue to have an in-person worship experience at 10.30 a.m. If you will be joining us in person, reserve your family's tickets on our website. We are having kids ministry and taking every precaution to keep your family safe and healthy. We will sanitize everything before and after service in our kids rooms, as well as our main service areas. We can't wait to see you next week in person. Don't forget to reserve your tickets so we can have everything ready for you when you come. Church, we are praying for you and so thankful you joined us online today.